My name is Mark Elliott uh, from Manchester University, the National Centre for Research Methods and uh, lead of the UK Anonymisation Network. Uh, in the previous uh, talk I described to you the sort of basic concepts of anonymisation uh, and this one I'm going to go through a framework that we call the anonymisation decision making framework uh, and that's a framework which helps you to make decisions about your data situation uh, and to anonymise effectively. Okay, so what's the uh, anonymization decision making framework or the ADF? It's a system for developing anonymization policy uh, and it's a practical tool for understanding your data situation. Important point to emphasize uh, at this stage is that it isn't a checklist. Uh, you can't just go through the ADF ticking boxes uh, and pop out with a nicely anonymized data set at the end. There's a context interplay between different considerations that you will need to take account of and sometimes you're going around in circles between different steps in the process uh, until you get to a resolved data situation. What's your responsibility? You're holding some data and you want to make sure that it's safe um, or you particularly want to share it or release it or disseminate it in some way. What you need to do is understand how a privacy breach might occur with your data in your data situation. Understand the possible consequence of that breach and then reduce the risk of that breach occurring to a negligible level. And the concept of negligibility is quite important. We're not asking for risk to be reduced to zero and we are asking for risk to be reduced to a very low level. Now fortunately, getting risk down from moderate to negligible is a lot easier than getting risk from negligible to zero. So negligible is a slightly flexible concept and it means really that a risk that a reasonable person would ignore. Okay, so in fact there is a 10 point process to the anonymization decision making framework. I'll list them off here. Now I'm going to go through each of these in turn, so I'm not going to go through them in, on this particular slide. But what I will say is there's three different activities. The first is the data situation audit, which is made up of the first five points. The second is disclosure risk assessment and control, and that's the technical process, the technical part of the process. And the third is impact management, and that is the soft processes that you have to go through to make sure that the, any impact of any breach is reduced should things go wrong. Okay, so what do you actually have to do? The first thing is to understand and describe your data situation. So is the situation static or dynamic? By static we mean simply we're looking at an existing data set in a particular environment and saying actually is that safe? So you might do that as part of a risk review. The second is thinking about data moving around. So a dynamic data situation is one where data is being shared or released into new environments. So what are the environments that the data is moving around in? And how does the data that you have relate to that environment? So here's an example. So here we have a data situation where we're moving data in fact into three environments. So we might imagine an organization that's collecting data passing data to a local authority as part of some legal process and the local authority wants to release some aggregates from that uh, data that's collected from the, third, th from the third party and releasing aggregates means essentially publishing open data. Now each of those data processes will have its own risks associated with it and each of those environments will have their own risks associated with it as the data moves through them. So you need to understand in your particular situation and this sort of flow diagram often helps that. Second point is you need to understand the legal and governance issues that surround your particular data sets. What legislation is relevant? Often it's the Data Protection Act but it may well be that other legislation governs the particular uses that your data may be put to. How does different legislation interact in terms of what it, you are allowed to do and not do? Related to this is what happened to the data before it reached you? Have you are you the primary collector of the data or are you a secondary user? And what's the governance processes that were 
affecting the original owners of the data um, before they handed it over to you? And how does that interact with what you're allowed to do with the data now? This can be a quite a complex stage. Now, know your data. And actually, m maybe this particular idea, well, of course I need to know my data, but actually just getting a map of your data, and in the framework we have a template for doing this, actually having a map of all the different properties of data and then thinking how these relate to the notions of risk is actually quite important. And doing that as an exercise uh, at an early stage uh, is very important and can then frame your risk management process. So where have the data come from? How were they collected? Who are the data controllers for the data? Are there any other parties involved as data processors? What are their responsibilities? Is the data about people? And is the base data personal data? So data could be about people and not be personal if it's been anonymized. And similarly, sometimes data can appear not to be about people, but actually still be personal data. Uh, a good example of this was uh, the data collected by the Department for Community and Local Government uh, on fires, uh, fire the fire rescue service. And that data ostensibly was about fires, but fires often have a very close association with individual people because they happen uh, in locations, often people's houses. And therefore those data were still personal data, even though ostensibly they were not about people. Data subjects, who are they? Are they a vulnerable or a sensitive group? What is the relationship between the data subjects and the data? Have they given any sort of consent to its reuse? And so on. What type of data do you have? Is it quantitative, qualitative? It's in the form of microdata or aggregates or some other form. What type of variables do you have? Do you have any variables that would be regarded as sensitive, either in law or just generally in terms of how they're understood? Do you have any standard identifiers? Properties of the data set that might be relevant. The quality of the data. Actually, this is slightly paradoxical, but lower quality data is actually lower risk. It's less easy to find somebody if the data is of lower quality. Is the data time-linked? Is it hierarchical or flat? Does it, is it drawn from multiple sources? Is it a population or is it a sample of a population? And all of these properties uh, can affect the risk. And we now understand the use case. And again, you may not be entirely clear about why you need to do this. What will the data be used for? Now, it may be that there's a specific request to share the data. It's a specific organisation who wants to use it for a specific purpose. Actually, understanding that purpose in detail will allow you to arrive at what is effectively a minimum specification for the data that are needed. So what variables are needed? Is all the data needed or will a sample suffice? Who will hold the shared data? Who will access it and how? Essentially, these are definitions of the data and the data environment in that, that new situation. If you've got a well-understood use case, and then you go back and start thinking about what sort of data you're able to release in terms of its risk, then you can have a dialogue between yourself and the potential user. Now, in more general use cases, where perhaps you're disseminating a data set for research purposes or as open data, you can still usefully think about how users would like to use this data uh, and to sort of think about what actually is of the most value. Understanding your ethical obligations beyond the legal constraints is also important. Where are the loci of consent with these data? And this can be quite complicated. So the data subjects may not have been involved in any direct consent process. So this happens when, often when there are multiple levels of data subjects. So for example, GP data. Consent is often given by GPs to access those data, but not by the patients. And the, the data actually are data about GPs, and they're also data about uh, the patients as well. So there's a complex mix of different types of data subjects. So who's consented to what is actually quite important in terms of understanding your ethical obligations. And who is aware of what? Not just to do with the uh, notion of consent, but also awareness. And are there reasonable expectations uh, 
that a data subject might have as to what is going to happen to their data, the data about them, once they've handed it over for one purpose. Is it reasonable to, for them to expect that it won't be used for another purpose? Or would it be in the normal expectation of a data subject that actually their data would be reused? Uh, and that's a very fuzzy area, but it's something that's important to understand, thinking about in terms of your data flow. Is the data situation sensitive? So is the topic of the data sensitive? Is it about a particularly stigmatising disease, for example? Is the population that the data is about a vulnerable population? Perhaps it's a data about children. And are there any sensitive variables, again, either legally or in terms of what's generally understood to be sensitive? OK, and now we move on to the technical disclosure control part of the framework. Identify the processes you will need to use to assess disclosure risk. Now, there's a separate talk on that, uh, on disclosure risk assessment and, and control. Here we'll just go through very briefly the main points. The first of these is scenario analysis. Now this is very important. You are answering the question which you set yourself earlier on, which was how might a privacy breach occur? Until you know that, you can't possibly go about measuring the risk. So it's not an abstract notion of risk assessment, but a very located one. This is the thing that I'm imagining happening, and this is how it might happen and then you can measure the risk of that particular event. Now usually it's some form of re-identification, but what resources is this imaginary person who's going to do this re-identification going to be using? And that's where we start thinking about the data environment. So these data are going to be in this environment, so a potential adversary will have access to these resources in order to do the re-identification. And you can think about the mapping between those. And that's the function of scenario analysis. Statistical disclosure risk assessment is a formal process of measuring the risk. Once you've defined the sets of key variables, and again I'll talk about that in more detail in the particular talk on disclosure risk assessment. Penetration tests are a simulation of an actual attack. So here we say to uh, an individual, OK, here's the data set you see if you can find somebody in there and there are processes formalising how you go about doing those penetration tests either in-house or indeed as a crowdsourced hacking challenge. Comparative data situation analysis takes the idea that you consider your own situation at the moment as to be safe and secure uh, and therefore operate it as a gold standard. So if you're going to do a one-to-one -one share with another organisation, this can be particularly relevant because you can think about your data as you currently have it in your data environment and then what's the comparative risk in a different data environment. And if that is less than the risk in your current data environment, it's probably sufficient to say that it is sufficiently safe. Final point here is just consider using a thermostat approach to this. Now, this is a really good strategy if you're thinking about releasing open data. Go for a really cautious level of risk to start with. Release that and hopefully nothing will happen. And the environment will become used to your data being existent, the population will become used to, there'll be inquiries made about it, you'll get an understanding about demand for different types of data so you can enrich your understanding of the use case and then you can go for a slightly more liberal approach, just tweaking up the thermostat a little. Uh, and this technique's been used, for example, uh, by the German Statistical Agency in determining uh, the data that will be released into their research data centres. Once you've done your risk analysis, then you know where it is you've got to bring the risk down, down to that negligible level, and, and what controls you're going to apply. And essentially, there's two types of controls. You can restrict access in some way or other, who, how, what, where, and to do what. Or you can place controls on the data. So you might, for example, take, only release a sample of the data rather than the full data set. You might decide to aggregate or suppress variables, or you might perturb by adding some noise to the data in some way. I'm not going to go into the details of those, uh, and again, just uh, there will be some more on that in, in the next talk.
Output disclosure control can also be applied. So if you're allowing access in a restricted environment, there's still a question of what people take out of those environments. We don't just do analyses for the fun of it. We usually want to publish. We usually want to uh, use our outputs for other purposes. So what outputs are you going to let out if your means of controlling risk is to restrict access so that only a particular environment is used, such as a data centre? Okay, now we're moving on to the impact side of uh, the anonymization decision-making framework. The first point is identifying who your stakeholders are and plan how you will communicate with them. Who needs to know about your share? Who needs to know about the release of data? Is it the data subjects, the wider public, the users? These are questions you need to address. Once you've identified, then what is the engagement you're going to, going to uh, carry out? Will they be involved in the design of the data? And that might be particularly relevant to users, but it could involve data subjects as well. Is there going to be a consultation? And for some uh, where you might be changing policy around particular use of particular data, a consultation with the wider public might be really important in terms of thinking how that's going to play out when it gets publicised uh, and not by you. And transparency might well be important. So being transparent, your own public announcements about the data, about the data processes, who you're sharing with and why, are all important in terms of building understanding about why you're doing what you're doing. And this will reduce the impact of a breach should it happen. What do they need to know? Well, as well as about the data, are you going to publish details of your anonymization process? There's some advantage of that. It might reassure people about the security. However, uh, if you do publish uh, details about some anonymization processes, this actually increases the risk of a breach. Plan what happens next once you've shared and released the data. You should be monitoring use and you should be considering, continuing to consider risk. Risk will change over time. Some elements of, uh, of time will make the risk go down. The data will, themselves will be getting older. But actually, some elements will increase the risk. New data are entering the data environment. New technologies are available to do linkage and so on. And you need to be constantly re looking at that. Also, another issue is why uh, you, you, you're not generally just considering releasing a single data set. This will be part of a series of releases as new data comes in on the same subject. So actually you're setting up a precedent and a policy which you'll then have to shift back from if you now consider the risk to be too high and that itself will need to be managed. Finally, you need to plan what you're going to do if things do in fact go wrong. Now we remember, we have accepted that we're not working at zero risk. Therefore, by definition, there is a residual risk. Therefore, there is a possibility that there'll be a breach. And therefore, you need to plan for that as part of your anonymization strategy. Avoid the lure of catastrophization. Okay? These aren't the, the same sort of problems as a nuclear power station blowing up. And it's very easy when thinking about data privacy to cast them in that light. Disclosure event mapping is a key thing. Like what is it that's happened? And if you've done your breach scenarios well, you should have a map for that already. What is it that's going to happen? And then what's going to happen next? So it's not simply that there's an event and that's the end of it. Well, actually, something will happen next. There'll be a play out in the media. There'll be your own communications. Will you talk to an adversary if it's an actual attack that's led to the breach? The idea is to be active and be planned. OK, to conclude, the anonymization decision-making framework is a tool which allows you to think constructively about your data situation. It moves us closer to a harmonised idea of anonymization which ties together the technical and the legal aspects uh, of that process. Now, we have an open access book forthcoming, uh, and if you look on www.ukanon.net, uh, you will see uh, more information about the likely release date. Thank you.